There once was a man who walked on two legs, wore clothes, and was a human being. But nevertheless, he was in reality a wolf. He had learned a great deal along the way. What he had not learned, however, was this. To find contentment in himself and his own life. And so the man had two natures. A human one and a wolfish one. This was his fate. And it may well be that it was not a very exceptional one. Inside him, the man and the wolf did not go the same way together. But were in continual and deadly enmity. One existed simply and solely to harm the other. And when there are two in one blood and in one soul who are at deadly enmity, then life fares ill. Wolfishly seen, all human activities are horribly absurd, misplaced, senseless, and vain. It cannot be denied the man was generally unhappy, and he can make others unhappy also. That is, when he loved them or they him. For all who got to love him saw only the one side of him. Many thought of him as a fine and clever fellow, but were horrified and disappointed when they came upon the other side of him. And they had to, because the man wished, as every sentient being does, to be loved as a whole. And therefore it was just with those whom he loved the most that he could least of all conceal and belie the wolf. Usually these were the most disappointed and angry of all. And so it was the human wolf brought his own dual and divided nature into the destinies of others beside himself whenever he came into contact with them. There were two now and then occasions when he could breathe and think and feel, sometimes as the wolf, sometimes as the man, clearly and without confusion of the two. And even on very rare occasions they made peace and lived for one another in such a fashion that not merely did they keep watch while the other slept, but each strengthened and confirmed the other. Now whether these short and occasional hours of happiness balanced and alleviated the lot of the wolf in such a fashion that the upshot happiness and suffering held the scales even, or whether perhaps the short but intense happiness of these few hours outweighed all suffering and left a balance over again is a question of which idle persons may meditate to their heart's content. Even the wolf brooded often over this and these were his idle and unprofitable days. There are a good many people of the same kind. Men for whom life has no repose, live at times in their rare moments of happiness with such strength and indescribable beauty, the spray of their moment's happiness, flung so high and dazzling over the wide sea of suffering, that the light of it, spread by all its radiance, touches others too with its enchantment. Thus, like a precious fleeting foam over the sea of suffering, arise all works in which a single individual lifts himself for an hour or so high above his personal destiny. His happiness shines like a star and appears to all who see it as something eternal and a happiness of their own. Their life consists of a perpetual tide, unhappy and torn with pain terrible and meaningless unless one is ready to see meaning in just those rare experiences, acts, thoughts, and works that shine out above the chaos of such a life. To such men the desperate and horrible thought has come that perhaps the whole of human life is but a bad joke, a violent and ill-fated abortion of the primal mother, a savage and dismal catastrophe of nature. To them too, however, the other thought has come that perhaps man is not merely a half-rational animal, but a child of the gods and destined to immortality. It happened to this man, as it does to all, that what he strove for with the deepest and most stubborn instinct of his being fell to his lot. In the beginning his dream and his happiness in the end was his bitter fate. The man of power is ruined by power, the man of money by money, the submissive man by subservience, 
the pleasure seeker by his pleasure. In the midst of his freedom he had attained, the man suddenly became aware that his freedom was a death and that he stood alone. The world in an uncanny fashion left him in peace. Others concerned him no longer. He was not even concerned for himself. He began to suffocate slowly, more and more, in the rarefied atmosphere of remoteness and solitude. For now it was his wish no longer, nor his aim to be alone and independent, but rather his lot and his sentence. The magic wish had been fulfilled and could not be cancelled, and it was no good now to open his arms with longing and goodwill and to welcome the bonds of society. People left him alone now. It was not, however, that he was an object of hatred and repugnance. To the contrary, he had many friends. A great many people liked him. But it was no more than sympathy and friendliness. Once in his life he received invitations, presents, pleasant letters. But no more. No one came near him now. For the air of lonely men surrounded him, a still atmosphere in which the world around him slipped away, leaving him incapable of relationship, an atmosphere against which neither will nor longing availed. This was the significant earmark of his life. Another was that he was numbered among the tragedies. What is peculiar to this tragedy is that his ego, rightly or wrongly, is felt to be extremely dangerous, dubious, and doomed germ of nature. That he is always in his own eyes exposed to extraordinary risk, as though he always stood with the slightest foothold on the peak of a crag, whence a slight push from without or an instant's weakness from within suffices to precipitate him into the void. In this aspect, tragedy presents those who are overtaken by a sense of guilt, inherent in individuals, those souls that find the aim of life not in perfecting and molding of the self, but in liberating themselves by going back to Mother, back to God, back to the All. Many of these natures are wholly incapable of having recourse because they have a profound consciousness in the sin of doing so. For us they are tragedies nonetheless, for they see death, not life as the releaser. They are ready to cast themselves back, to surrender, to be extinguished and to go back to the beginning. It is possible the man one day will be led to this latter alternative. He may get a hold of one of the cherished little mirrors and encounter the immortals. He may find in one of their magic theaters the very thing that is needed to free his neglected soul. A thousand such possibilities await him. His fate brings them on, leaving him no choice. For those outside of the bourgeois live in the atmosphere of these magic possibilities. And all of this was very well known to the wolf, even though his eye may never fall on this fragment of his inner biography. He has a suspicion of his allotted place in the world, a suspicion of the immortals, a suspicion that he may meet himself face to face. And he is aware of the existence of that mirror in which he has such a bitter need to look and from which he shrinks in such deathly fear. Human man is not capable of love in any high degree, and even the most spiritual and highly cultivated of men habitually sees the world and himself through the lenses of delusive formulas and artless simplifications, and most of all, himself. For it appears to be an inborn and imperative need of all men to regard themselves as a unit. However often and however grievously this illusion is shattered, it always mends again. The judge who sits over the criminal looks into his face and at one minute recognizes all the emotions and potentialities and possibilities of the criminal in his own soul and hears the criminal's voice as his own is at the next moment one and indivisible as the judge, 
and scuttles back into the shell of his cultivated self and does his duty and condemns the criminal to death. And if ever the suspicion of their manifold being dawns upon men of unusual powers and of unusually delicate perceptions, if they break through the illusion of the unity of personality and perceive that the self is made up of a bundle of selves, they have only to say so and at once the majority puts them under lock and key. Call science to aid, establishes schizomania and protects humanity from the necessity of hearing the cry of truth from the lips of these unfortunate persons. Why then waste words? Why utter a thing that every thinking man accepts as self-evident? In reality, however, every ego, so far from being a unity, is the highest degree of a manifold world. A constellated heaven, a chaos of forms, of states and stages, of inheritances and potentialities. It appears to be a necessity, as imperative as eating and breathing, for everyone to be forced to regard this chaos as a unity and to speak of his ego as though it were onefold and clearly detached and a fixed phenomenon. Even the best of us shares in this delusion. The delusion rests simply upon a false analogy. As a body, everyone is single. As a soul, universal. Faust, Mistopheles, Wagner, and the rest form a unity of supreme individuality. And it is in this higher unity alone, not in the several characters, that something of the true nature of the soul is revealed. When Faust greeted with a shudder of astonishment the Philistine, saying, Two souls, alas, do dwell within my breast. He has forgotten Mephisto and a whole crowd of other souls that he has in his heart likewise. The heart and the body are indeed one, but the souls that dwell in it are not two. Not five, but countless in number. Man is a Russian doll made up of a hundred integuments, a texture of many threads. He believes, like Faust, that two souls are far too many for a single heart, and must tear the breast asunder. Human man is not by any mean a fixed and enduring form. He is much more an experiment and a transition. He is nothing else than the narrow and perilous bridge between nature and spirit. And between the two forces his life hangs tremulous and irresolute. Human man, whatever people think of him, is never anything more than a temporary compromise. A little consciousness. A little morality is called for, and a modicum of spirit is not only permitted, but is even thought to be necessary. The human man of this concordant, like every other ideal, is a compromise, a timid and artless experiment, with the aim of cheating both the angry primal mother nature and the troublesome primal father spirit of their pressing claims and living in a temperate zone between the two of them. For this reason, the bourgeois today burns his heretics and hangs his criminals, those to whom he erects monuments tomorrow. Human man is not yet a finished creation, but rather a challenge of the spirit, a distant possibility dreaded as much as it is desired, that the way towards it has been covered only a very short distance and with terrible agonies and ecstasies, even by those few for whom it is the scaffold today and the monument tomorrow. He is resolved to forget that the desperate clinging to the self, the desperate clinging to life, are the surest ways to eternal death, the power to die, to strip oneself, and the eternal surrender of the self brings immortality to them. His tendency to explain, just as the schoolmaster would, the supreme and special gift, rather than as an outcome of immense powers of surrender and suffering, of his indifference to the ideals of the ordinary, and of his patience that at the last extremity of loneliness, 
which rarefies the atmosphere of the bourgeois world to an icy cold ether around those who suffer to become men that loneliness of the garden of Gethsemane. He would like either to overcome the wolf and become holy man or to renounce mankind and live holy as a wolf. Had he done so, he would have seen, perhaps, that even animals are not undivided in spirit. With him, too, the well-knit beauty of the body hides a being of manifold states and strivings. The wolf, too, has abysses. The wolf, too, suffers. The man can never turn back again and become holy wolf. And could he do so, he would find that even the wolf is not of primeval simplicity but already a creature of manifold complexity. Even the wolf has two, or more than two, souls in his wolf heart. And he who desires to be a wolf falls into the same forgetfulness as the man who sings, If I could be a child once more. He whose sentimentality sings of blessed childhood is thinking of the return to nature, and innocence in the origin of things has quite forgotten that these blessed children are beset with conflict and complexities and capable of all suffering. There is in fact no way back to either the wolf or to the child. From the very start there is no innocence and no singleness. Every created thing, even the simplest, is already guilty, already multiple. It has been thrown into the muddy stream of being and may never more swim back again to its source. The uncreated into God leads on. Not back. Not back to the wolf or back to the child, but ever further into sin. Ever deeper into human life. All birth means separation from the all. The confinement within limitation. The separation from God. The pangs of being born ever anew. The return to the all. The dissolution of painful individuation. The reunion with God means the expansion of the soul until it is able once more to embrace the all.